So great, thank you. Um, so Phil, I'm not sure we met, but my name is Ben Breger. I'm a planner uh, for the town of Amherst and um, help with the uh, administer the block grant program. So nice to nice to meet you. And um, what's your role with the survival center? I, I, I manage red tape and watch the money. Gotcha. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Well, good. So um, the meeting today is uh, kind of a combined one because uh, as a beneficiary for the 2020 grant and for the 2021 grant, this can serve as the closeout meeting for 2020 and the startup meeting for the 21 grant. So trying to be efficient with time. But um, I think so for the for the 2020 grant, I mean, there's not that much to go over because you, um, you know, ended the grant I think a few months ago and you know submitted your final report um, you know zeroed out the balance um, you know obviously I was just looking over the the stated goals for the 2020 grant and then the um, services provided and it seems like you you know very much met or exceeded all <laughs> of the goals which um, just speaks to the need um, that you're serving and the importance of the work that you're that you're doing for the town um so i think the 2020 grant as far as i'm concerned you know we've already filed with the state to kind of begin closing that out and you know hopefully nate nate has been great because he's uh, i'm going to slowly you know take over more of this work and he's handing me a blank uh, hopefully, you know, blank slate, the 17, 18, 19, and now the 20 grants are all closed out, which keeps things easier, easy for me. Um, and so are there any questions about the previous grant or any concerns or no? Yeah, no. And then, so for the 21 grant, um, I did, um, obviously I sent the contract over a few weeks ago. So I just wanted to check on that, that um, you'll be able to have it signed and sent back um, at some point. Cause that, that, that would be the last step, I guess, in getting the grant up and running or the, yeah, the contract up and running. Yeah, I just need to track down Chris who was at a conference this weekend to get a final couple of signatures on yeah that. yeah yeah that makes sense yeah there's a few a few signatures required on that one so he's the clerk okay so great great it's that um, authority to sign things mm -hmm. so. that makes sense yeah and so once the i'm pretty sure this is the case because the contract starts june 1st you know if there you can um backdate expenses to june 1st even if it's you know not signed and everything until for another few days or weeks um so i'll look look for that from 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 you guys um and then and get phil can i just chime in you obviously we're going to send the original over to the town um but in addition to whatever paper copy we keep uh you'll upload the copy to our sharepoint contract folder okay thanks i usually save a the like unsigned version oh, there and okay. I didn't realize that I didn't. So I just want to make sure that we, you know, get that oh, yes. copy in the folder as well for ref easy reference in addition to the you know mm -hmm. paper copy. Great. And so just in terms of like um you know documentation and administering the grant, um obviously this is it, you've done a number of these grants. Um but just wanting to make sure you're uh, have an in using an intake form um, for for I guess for Amherst residents who are being served um, at the survival center. Yeah, so similar to what we've been doing for a couple of years um, or many years, we have incorporated all of the CDBG required information into our standard pantry registration. Um, so we collect the same information from everybody regardless of their town. Um, those That form has uh, 
long been approved yeah. at the town yeah. in terms of capturing that information. Um, people fill it out uh, once a year-ish. Um, so we're actually right now have been in the process of essentially getting like re-upping everybody's registration. So we have up-to-date information. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't get new registrations for everybody yeah. in like the height of COVID, though we had yeah. some people that were new to the pantry. We got all of those new, new anyway. And then, yeah, we enter all that info into our database and have a specialized report, the a custom report that the database company built for us to then like pull out the CDBG demographic reporting mm -hmm. info. So, yeah, so that's definitely ongoing. That gets captured. Um, and basically in the event that somebody hasn't completed that form for some reason, or if we didn't have the required information, we just don't count them in the numbers of people served, even if they did live in Amherst, like we mm -hmm. just effectively treat them as though, as far as Amherst CDBG reporting is, they would just not be counted if we didn't, um, if we didn't have a registration form for them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, good. And I guess, um, I think the other thing too, and obviously, you know, um, just the, the quarterly reports, um, this, the grant starts on June 1st. So the first, um, quarterly report would be, I would have to, yeah, it would be submitted to me on July, let's see, July 11th is the Monday. Um, so, you know, that, that might be only a few weeks of, of, of the grant actually being in place but so it could just be as simple as you know grant is up and running but no activity has started yet or something or no it you know but just to have something um submitted for july 11th would be great okay would it be acceptable to um the full report the demographic reporting um is significant on our end in terms of the work required could we submit a brief, given that it is ongoing, so it's not true that it's not up and running yet. Um, yeah, could we that's submit true. A yeah. brief narrative report for this first report that's a one month only. And then with the next quarterly report, provide all the demographic statistics for four months. So June through September 30th, would that be acceptable? Yeah, absolutely. So um yeah understanding that yeah the the demograph producing those demographic results would you know that you're saying just that would be really tough to do by july um mid-july uh it is not impossible but it would yeah. be challenging and given okay. that numbers are always year to date i'm just i guess exactly. seeing permission from you if that would be oh okay. yeah just yeah yeah we would submit a demographic report not with this first one in july we would do it in september or sorry in the october report uh, for, the full four, yeah. for the full four months as opposed to for one month and then the full four months yeah yeah no i i that makes sense to me because like yeah like you said it's always cumulative anyway so um you know i think it's i i like to have agencies kind of just keep tab just to make sure they're keeping tabs along the way so that at the end of the you know grant year that you know the numbers all add up and they you know show that they've been documenting all along but i think that's what you just described makes a lot of sense i think it, it's fine if you um do that beneficiaries summary um for the september uh report okay. so yeah. that's great and we will submit financial reporting in july based on whether or not we have uh actually spent the cdbg funds in yeah. um just based on our current needs and obviously the cdbg is a you know it's a it's a percentage of the funds that are used to yeah. serve nurse residents in the pantry. Um, it, per our uh, most recent conversations between Phil and I, we're anticipating not expensing CDBG funds until July 1. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Keep it aligned with our fiscal year. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that, that kind of covers 
my questions just in terms of administration and implementation. I guess um, uh, in terms of the the program itself, um, you know, I was just looking through some of your short term and long term goals. Um, you know, in terms of food access, you know, you're th you you're. I guess you actually probably wrote this these goals in this time last year almost <laughs> but uh you know you're thinking of you know going from one one week to two week of groceries i'm still aiming for 2000 residents um you know providing different access you know on site curbside pickup delivery evening and weekend hours i guess i'm just curious between when you applied for the grant and where you are now like how how are you um faring in terms of um accomplishing some of those goals and obviously COVID's come up and down and up and down and I'm sure you've been you know resilient and trying to accommodate yeah um I would say that uh at this juncture um it it's interesting because I think when we wrote this application which was almost a year ago I believe that at that time we were actually anticipating that it was based on some information from Nate that it was going to be a 2022 calendar year contract. So we were sort of writing it projecting a January to December contract, whereas now it's a June to June contract. Yeah. Um, but it actually has uh, kind of because of the rises in COVID and other various challenges, um, some of our advancement on those similar priorities have been pushed back a little bit. So yeah. actually the short-term goals as outlined in the contract are still a really perfect fit for mm -hmm. this upcoming contract year in terms of what our, what our targets are. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, very actively, you know, in the, we are very actively in the planning stages, um, and moving along with this, what will be required in order to increase to two weeks yeah. um, and are anticipating doing that um, within this contract year. We're hoping to do that by basically the end of 2022 or very mm -hmm. 2023. So, um, and some of the other pieces are more ongoing work that we're continuing to, you know, work on and make progress on. Um, and we have definitely solidified our commitment at this juncture of maintaining the curbside pickup and delivery um, and actually expanding delivery further um, okay. in addition to the onsite pantry mm -hmm. because we're really, uh, really seeing strong, strong, uh, programmatic food security impact uh of those two pieces right of the right yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense and i think too like you know do you find also just geographically being up in the corner of town you it's it's for its heart makes it difficult for folks in you know downtown area or south amherst to access services and I, I guess it, there's a bus line but yeah um i think that the geography certainly plays a role, um, but I think that it, almost in some ways for the pantry, uh, regardless of where in Amherst somebody is located, just their access to yeah. a car or reliable transportation yeah. is really significant because even if someone lives very close, um, if they don't have access to a vehicle, especially as we've increased the allocation of groceries, it's a lot to try lot to carry, yeah. home. Um, so certainly we have long seen the challenges for folks trying to get to us on the buses um, from South Amherst. Uh, well, I think, you know, for a town as rural as us, we actually have pretty decent mm -hmm. public transportation. Um, but what we really see there is that the fact that someone would have to, for example, from South Point Apartments, actually take three buses yeah, exactly. with yeah. various weights, that is pretty impossible to do, like with groceries and kids in tow. Um, the other problem that we have continued to hear from people is the bag limit that PBTA has, right. um, which I just will mention this because I think this is actually a really important equity consideration for the town to have influence on um, in whatever negotiations are coming up that um, 
And so far, PBTA's answer has been that, well, it's up to the driver and they don't have to enforce it. Mm -hmm. um, but what that the experience of that from the rider standpoint is that they can't depend on being able to get on the bus with their groceries. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people do also definitely report not always equitable enforcing of the rule. And so, um, you know, someone really, if they don't know if they're going to be able to get on the bus with their groceries, that's really not a viable. Uh, yeah, that's not, that's, that's not okay. Yeah. And maybe not be allowed onto the bus with them. So um, I think that's a really, really important yeah. um, food access issue for us to, for the town to consider advocating around with the PBTA bus system. Um, but yes, absolutely. The delivery program, I think has just, or I don't think, I know has made an enormous access improvement for people all throughout town um, in terms of saving time, just the scheduling of it yeah. uh, for folks that have kids that are with them. Um, you know, certainly hard to come here and wait in line. And with the increased numbers that we're seeing, you know, just lines are longer. And so um, that's been a really, really positive thing for a lot of folks. Uh, when we reopened Choice Pantry almost a year ago for people to be able to come in and again, just pick mm. items off the shelf, uh, we were expecting a more significant drop off from delivery than what we saw. Mm -hmm. um, and so while well, we certainly had some folks that if they had access to a vehicle or could get here, they wanted to come in and be able to choose their own groceries or even some folks, especially like a small household yeah. that could take the bus. Um, but a lot of people have just said that the delivery, it means they actually get the groceries every month. Whereas before when they were before COVID, when they were having to come here and that was the only option, they might only make it every other month or every three mm -hmm. months or whatever it was, because that was when they could get here. And so this has really increased that reliability of their access to food. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. No, I think it, um, it kind of speaks to the, you know, the, the, um, service that like, uh, like the mobile market is providing too, just to, you know, bring, um, food directly to people or closer to people and just to cut down on those transportation barriers. Absolutely. Um, but, but yeah, I've, I've, I've heard a few times this issue with the bag limit on PBTA also just, just for people to even, you know, there, there are buses to, I think big Y and stop and shop, but just the, yeah. the bag issue becomes bag limit becomes an issue as there as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is worth like discussing that with the PVTA and a better understanding. I mean, I imagine it might be like a f emergency, like egress kind of thing. If, if there's too many bags in the way, that, that's all I can really think of. But, but um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it certainly is not a policy uh, yeah. that exists in public transportation in many other towns, yeah. municipalities, large cities, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. They have all yeah. the same emergency concerns. Yeah. So, um, all right. Um, well, I think, um, I think that's that about all in terms of questions that I had. Um, I think I'm curious too. Um, I guess it's been a while, but I know you, you were having some staff turnover, um, Maybe it was a, more so last summer, but um, do you feel like you're fully staffed up at this point or you still um, have some openings that you're tr trying to fill? Yeah, I mean, I would say like everybody, yeah. um, I mean, honestly, I think we're doing better than a lot of organizations and businesses yeah. as I talk to other colleagues about the hiring, but uh, yes, certainly I think um Workforce, uh, yeah. workforce stability has is a is a challenge that a lot yeah. of businesses and organizations are facing. So, um, we do have we have a really really strong team of staff in place. Um, we do have some turnover, um, you know, to some extent as is to be expected with these right. positions. Um, so we have definitely had some. Right now, we're hiring for we're in the final stages of hiring for another pantry assistant. Um, so that was a result of an internal promotion yeah. 
then um, of a kitchen assistant. We had an employee who left um, and we're anticipating hiring for one of our coordinator positions connected to the pantry um, within the coming weeks. Um, I do, I know that Gail had brought this up in the committee meeting and I um, did just want to mention to you because I think it may have played a part in her consideration of it that we shifted to a model of having, we have three coordinators in the pantry right now. Mm -hmm. We have a sourcing and operations coordinator, someone who coordinates the onsite pantry and someone who coordinates the delivery program, as opposed to before COVID, we only had one. And so I do just want to mention that that, that obviously has right. increased the number of times that we have indicated that we're hiring for right. a okay. coordinator, but it has not been that like someone only was here for three months and then left it was that but you know like they were okay yeah oh that's that's really that's, that's so good I to know yeah to clarify that piece yeah. as well. okay gotcha all right well that's yeah that's helpful that's good to know um and yeah i totally understand the the workforce yeah just being you know being flexible and understanding that people are there is turnover and I, I only ask just to like get a better sense if there's you know any concerns about ability to to implement the grant or, or meet meet the goals but it sounds like you know there's it's a normal level of turnover and obviously I do agree you have you, got, you have a strong staff and at, at least normal for yeah. now I don't know if it was yeah. normal yeah. you know five six, seven years ago but <laughs> yeah I think it's yeah no, the new normal yeah environment at this time yeah 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 um well good is there any anything else any other questions you had or um i think just briefly i'll let you know about the uh for the next round um i feel like i'm every day i grow more convinced that they're gonna push the um application deadline back to march um and i you know, our program, there's also been turnover at DHCD with the state. Um, we have a new a new interim like program representative. He, he's worked for the DHCD for a while, but it, it's kind of a new role for him. But he he basically told us, um, you know, gave, gave us his strong conviction that the uh, applicant, they would be releasing the what's called the one year action plan pretty soon. And that would specify the new application being due in March. Um, so we'll, you know, as soon as we have that confirmed, we'll, um, you know, look it over because that one year action plan also outlines like how much, how many, how much in funds each mini entitlement community is going to get, how many social service agencies they can fund and, you know, what are the state's objectives and, you know, there's some talk of maybe this being a two year grant, but maybe it'll just be a one year grant. So I think we'll, we'll have to, <laughs> um, just obviously review that, summarize it, and then get that out to the agencies as soon as possible so you all can plan accordingly. Okay. So if it is due to the state in March, that would, which is how it used to be, that would yeah. trickle back to probably our application being due to you in December. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what Nate and I had discussed. So the, yeah, we it would probably be yeah somewhere around um december and then the committee would have you know january to review and get questions back and then give us february to get it all ready and prepared and submitted to the state so yeah that that was kind of my understanding as well um it does mean that the public hearing we had last month it's not you know uh we'll have to hold another similar type hearing probably in uh, August or September, um, you know, it, it can build on what we learned in the May hearing, but uh, I think the state wants to see like, okay, you, you know, this kind of progression of like, they released the one year action plan with their priorities, this, the town then hears local priorities, and then you build from there. So because we didn't have the one year action plan in May, they're, you know, suggesting we hold another hearing, which I think makes sense, because it'll be, you know, four months later potentially so okay um do you anticipate um collecting additional responses um as far as the need survey that you did in that case um i hadn't thought of that um 
I think we we've already closed the um, survey, and I think um, you know I I did have it open for I think four or five weeks at that point. Um, so I think yeah, I guess it would be a conversation I would have with the committee about um, you know just what would be the you know purpose of that, and you know are there more um, you know different avenues for outreach we could we could yeah. do that so. I guess I would just advocate for that. It seems like while there were, you know, not an insignificant number of responses, there's yeah. like a huge number of responses in terms of the population. Yeah, no, um, I, I agree. And it seems yeah. like most of the responses really came through the school. Um, so I think it would be, um, yeah, I know, I think in the past there was a time when there was a survey like that um, and, you know, I just feel like even, for example, like letting folks at the Amherst Survival Center, you know, know that that's a large population of mm -hmm. folks who are low and moderate income in Amherst and it's an opportunity for folks. I mean, you know, they may choose to weigh in on food insecurity, but they also have lots of other needs as well and can kind of address that. So, and I think other organizations could also help put that out or yeah. that, um, yeah, there would be other, you know, various ways to get it out. So um, I think I would encourage that yeah. to consider getting a broader response um, if that is indeed going to be informing the needs selection process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, yeah, similar to, you know, there's something to be said about um, the, uh, you know, that I, I ran that survey in, in like March or April and, you know, things can change between, you know, that would be six months before, you know, proposals are, are put out. So if the, if it's pushed till September um, or, or even later. So yeah, just having a more, because this process is now being extended, um, you know, having a more, uh, you know, timely, I guess, collection of priorities from, from residents. Um, you know, I think there's justification for that, certainly. So, yeah, no, thanks for that suggestion. We have the committee meeting um, in a few weeks, so I'll, I'll discuss that with them. Okay, that's yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sounds good. Well, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time, um, to chat and, uh, nice to meet you virtually, Phil. And, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look for the email from you guys for, with the contract, but, um, yeah. Hey. Are there any other questions? Okay. I'll set up our end. Thanks so much, Ben. All right. Awesome. Great. Okay. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.